issues for journalists. If you missed last month's presentation on defamation and false light, you can find it on our website, www.nationalpress.org. I'm Linda Topping Streitfeld, Director of Programs here at NPF. For those who don't know us, the National Press Foundation is a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. Our mission is to help journalists in the U.S. and around the world understand complex topics. We hope that everyone watching today will participate by asking questions. You can do that by typing the question into the chat box, which should be on the right side of your screen, and then click send. I'll be monitoring the questions and we'll get to as many as we have time for. By tomorrow, we expect to have a link on our website to the recorded version of this webinar. So if you need another look at one of the slides or you'd like to share it with a friend, you can find that again on our website at www.nationalpress.org. So let's get started. Kevin Goldberg is back with us today. He's a member at Fletcher Heald and Hildreth. He's also legal counsel to the American Society of News Editors, and he's a national expert on First Amendment copyright and trademark issues. Kevin is a popular speaker and writer. He's a member of the National Freedom of Information Hall of Fame and a member of the Executive Committee of the Board of Directors of the National Press Foundation. Kevin, welcome. Thank you. Let's uh, start hearing about copyright. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. I actually was just saying to, to Bob that I really enjoy this presentation, and I think it's exceptionally important because um, I was having a conversation last night with a journalist who said they've hired all this younger staff at their publication, and they're, they're telling these people to just be active all day, updating Twitter, updating their Facebook pages, posting to the blog as much as they can. It's all about pushing information out. And he said he's really concerned with libel uh, problems in that, in that situation. And I actually said I'm more concerned with copyright problems in that situation. Because a lot of these people have to act quickly. They are their own, uh, again, they're, they're not only their own editors, they're not only their own writers, but sometimes they're, they're their own sound, video, photographers as well. It's, as we know, it's become really easy to, to do just about everything. And, and you know, and there, there are sources for just about any kind of graphic you want anywhere. And it becomes really easy to use these things without oversight, without real knowledge, really easy to violate uh, the laws as well. So again, my job today, as I said last month, is not necessarily to teach. My job is more to scare. Um, I'm, I'm really hopeful that again you stop for just one second and think about what I've told you today before you hit publish. Think about, okay, where did I get this? What are the steps I should be going through in my own mind before I use a particular piece of content if it's not my own? And as well, what should I be doing to protect my own content? Uh, so this is more of an overview. Copyright is honestly one of the most difficult topics in all of law, certainly one of the most difficult things I deal with. Um, and, and one of the reasons is people don't really have a clear, clear uh, understanding of what a copyright is, certainly versus a trademark or a patent. I will admit that even after 16 years of practicing law and, and a lot of it in copyright and trademark law, I find myself interchangeably using the terms by mistake every so often. It just slips out that you know, I say trademark when I mean copyright, I say copyright when I mean trademark. Patent is a little bit different, but all are a form of intellectual property. And that simply means that this is something that could be bought, sold, licensed, used just like real property. It has a value, only you obviously can't really put it in your hands. It's, it's, something, a little, it's something that is intangible. Um, the main difference are that a patent is usually applied to something that is an idea or a functional thing. A copyright is the way you might express that idea and a trademark is probably the way you would brand or market that idea. So hopefully that's a little bit of a way, of a way for you all to keep these things straight in your own head. Um, let's move straight into copyright now, however, uh, and talk about some of the elements of copyright law that we're going to discuss today. As I said, um, hopefully when you're done today, you're going to be able to run through certain steps in your head, which is why I'm going to present this in a very step-by-step -step format today. And the first issue is, how do you determine whether something that you have created or something you've seen somewhere else but want to use is even copyrightable? How would it exist as a copyright? Who owns it? How long do they own it? And what rates do they own? In other words, is it yours or is it someone else's? And if you've determined that it is someone else's, what must you do or avoid doing? And that is to look into the concept of substantial similarity. And if you are doing something that would be a substantially similar use or identical use of someone else's copyrighted work, well, how can you use that work without getting in trouble? Primarily by perhaps purchasing or licensing the content, or engaging in a fair use, 
or knowing that you have some other defense at your disposal that will protect you. And we'll talk near the end about some of the safe harbors and defenses that I think anybody who is publishing on the web should definitely employ. Um, straight into then the elements of copyright ownership. And what we'll do is probably break after every one of those main topics, take some questions for people. So if, if you all out there in, in, in internet land have uh, any questions you want to ask, start thinking about a breakdown along those main topic areas. Um, and it's time to ask them. A copyright exists anytime you have an, in, have an original work of authorship that is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. It's taken me years to get it to roll off the tongue like that, but that's all it takes, an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium, medium of expression. Now, an original work of author is something that's simply independently created. Any minimum degree of creativity would allow a copyright to exist. Doesn't mean that it has to be good. Uh, a work of authorship is something that is liter you know, spelled out in the copyright law as a literary, musical, dramatic, pantomime, choreographic, pictorial, graphic, sculptural, motion picture, audiovisual, or audio works. And that covers just about anything that goes on in major media nowadays. Uh, a fixed work is something that is um, not fleeting in nature. It's something that has been captured. So the live performance of something itself is not a fixed work. The, the, the script that you're working off of might be, the videotape that we're doing right now is a copyrightable work. But there doesn't exist a copyright to what I'm doing here right now if I were doing it for a live audience. There would be, you know, not in my spoken words. There would be in my PowerPoint. There, would, there will be once we're done taping this. But the actual ongoing work of my presenting this is not itself a copyrightable work because it's not fixed. Um, and finally, a tangible medium of, medium of expression is anything in which those can exist. For our purposes, it's most important to understand that it includes radio and television, of course. We, we know the printed, the printed word also is, is going to be a, a thick, tangible medium of expression. But the internet. Um, I, I do not want to hear, and this probably won't be the last time I say this, I do not want to hear from anybody anywhere that they felt comfortable using something without permission because it was on the internet. Okay, we'll get back to that in just a, a couple seconds. Um, let's move back in a little more to what is an original work of authorship and just how low that standard really is. Originality, as I said, is a very low threshold. It simply requires that the author has created the work himself or herself and has some minimum degree of creativity or, or unique value to it. Um, again, doesn't mean that it's good in any sense. Courts are not arbiters of talent, taste, or anything else. Just some minimum degree of creativity. The two examples that work best in this are the one thing that the Supreme Court has definitively said is not original enough to be worthy of copyright protection, the phone book. There's absolutely, the court said when, when one, one rural phone company wanted to basically you know, prevent another one from doing the exact same thing, creating a phone book in the local area, well, you can't prevent them from doing that because you have no copyrightable work yourself in a phone book. It doesn't take any manner of creativity to take a number of, a bunch of names, addresses, and phone numbers, slap them in alphabetical order, and put them out there. On the other hand, something that we all see every day and consider to have been public and, and probably consider we all own uh, or have some sort of American ownership in is the screenshot that you see here of the Zapruder film of the JFK assassination. Um, you know, it, everybody sort of believes it's a historical document that nobody really owns, but a court has actually said the family of Abraham Zapruder does own this video. They said that it was sufficiently original to be copyrighted, and, and the argument back on the other side was, well, I mean, he just pointed a camera and shot. He stood somewhere, he pointed a camera and shot, and the court said, that's fine. He could have stood anywhere. He could have used any type of camera. Somewhere, somehow, even if it was an unconscious choice, choices were made. He has a unique view than anybody else has, okay? There were, there were distinctions that could occur. They did occur, and therefore, this version of this event is copyrighted to the Zapruder family. Now we move on to a work of authorship. A work of authorship is basically the expression of that idea, as I said, which is required for a copyright, for a copyrightable work. And what we're really talking about here are something that is big enough to be a work of authorship. So the idea, first of all, of boy meets girl, not copyrightable. 
The idea of boy named Romeo meets girl named Juliet from rival family that is then expressed in a long play or any number of movies or variations on that theme movies, that is a copyrightable work of authorship. Short phrases, names, titles, and short phrases don't qualify for copyright protection. So the two examples I'll give you in a second are trademarkable. They are things that can be used in marketing and things that can be protected for the sole use of one person, but as a trademark, not as a copyright. And those are the short phrase, you're fired, as used by Donald Trump in The Apprentice, and that's hot with Paris Hilton. I've got to get some new examples here. These are starting <laughs> to get a little dated. Um, <laughs> I don't think she's even protecting that's hot anymore. But those are, those are short phrases that would not be copyrighted. So ownership in the copyright vests with the person who has created the work. And we talked earlier about the, uh, the fixation and the tangible medium of expression. So once you have that original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression, you have a copyrightable work that is owned by the person who created it or the joint creators and is generally owned by the, you know, it doesn't even require registration. It is generally owned by the person, the individual who created that work, unless there is some other agreement in place. That agreement is most commonly referred to as a work for hire. Uh, many of us might be familiar with that term. Many of you who are freelancers probably are familiar with that term. Except that the idea of a work for hire um, is really something that's a little technical in nature, and it specifically refers to something that at the outset of work was declared to be a work for hire. Most likely, many of you, especially that are freelancers, simply have an employment contract saying, whatever you create just vests ownership in the company. It's a slight distinction that we'll talk about in a couple slides, but it is a distinction. Know, however, that in most freelance situations especially, most full-time employment situations especially, the creator is probably not, may or may not be the, um, the actual owner of the copyrighted work because it's going to vest in the employer or the contracting company. One thing to note about federal co government works are definitely not copyrighted. So you, you have a free reign to use federal government re published reports, things like that. Um, at the state level, however, state governments do have the ability to copyright their own works. So look closely to see if the state you're working in and the state report or the state document that you're trying to quote wholesale or, or use wholesale is copyrighted or not. Um, so what happens if something has been, is owned? Well, the first thing, or, or not created by you and therefore probably owned by other, it qualifies for copyright protection because it's an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. You didn't create it. Well, the first way you might be able to use that is if it is no longer copyrighted. This is the concept of public domain. Doesn't mean that the, the work is already being used somewhere. Again, here's where it comes. I teach a class, I think I mentioned this last time, at George Mason for journalism students. And I, it, it aggravates me, nay, scares me to no end when I hear someone say, well, I thought that because somebody had posted it to the internet, that meant they wanted it to be used and they had given up all their copyrights. It does not, and I will give you the same standard line I give to anyone else. Any of you out there that I find out has ever used a piece of copyrighted work from the internet and thought that you could do it because it was somehow made public, it was in the quote public domain, I'll, I'll get the list from you. I will find you and I will slap you, okay? <laughs> that ought to get your attention. Just because it's on the internet does not mean it's public, does not mean that you have an unfettered right to use that, that co content. Um, what, what it really means is that the copyright term has expired. And this is where we get into the idea of why a work for hire versus a, a you know, individually created work might be different. Um, that's also the reason, you, yeah, as I said, that you need to identify the owner and exactly when a work was created. Um, because the term of ownership, as explored by this chart, varies depending on whether the work was created by an individual person when it was created, there was a change in the Copyright Act in 1976. The copyright law basically from 1909 to 1976 had terms that existed of, of 28 years. And you could renew your copyright after the first term of 28 years for a second 28 years. Um, second, you have a situation, but now, I'm sorry, now you have a situation where it's tied to the life of the author or the creator and a certain period thereafter. But again, looking at something that might be an anonymous or pseudonym, pseudon, pseudonymous work or work for hire, there's no life of author involved. So let's go back to our example earlier, work for hire versus not work for hire. 
Work for hire, you know that the, the copyright exists for 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation. Let's say that you are working for a publication and they don't specifically say that what you've written is a work for hire. Does that mean that you own it? No, it doesn't. But it does mean that the term of the copyright will still be tied back to you. It just happens to be that the copyright is owned by a corporation, but not as a work for hire. So it comes back to you, the identifiable creator, and your life plus 70 years will be the term of that copyright. So again, a technical distinction that may never come into practice. And for most of you, you just know you don't own it. But if you're on the other side and you're looking at maybe an older work, whether you can reprint it wholesale, that's one thing you've got to keep in mind. Was it a work for hire? Or was it something that was just created within the scope of your employment, the person's employment, but not a work for hire? So what do we have here? We have now a copyrightable work that is owned by somebody. And what does that, that somebody get to do? They get to reproduce that copyrighted work, make copies of it. They get to prepare derivative work, say a movie based on a book, okay, or a, a movie based on a play. They have the right to distribute the work in any way. They have the right to perform the work in public. Again, if you've written a popular song, you get to control who, who remakes that song. You get, get to control who performs your play. Um, very recently, I, I noticed that one of, the, one of the better performances I've seen in the last couple of years, Mike Daisy's um, one-man show, The Agony and Ecstasy of Steve Jobs, which has gotten a lot of, of um, publicity in the last few, few months because it takes a look at the uh, labor practices of Apple in, in China at the Foxconn plant. Well, he's basically waived the performance right. He's put the, the text of his script up on the internet, and he said anybody can perform it anytime they want because he wants people to know about, about what's going on at Apple. That's his right. He never has an obligation to do that. Otherwise, if you wanted to use it, you'd have to get his permission. But he has given a free license for people to perform that work. And finally, to display the work, which usually comes into to obviously art and, and uh, other non-audio, non non-visual works. Um, so again, the copyright owner has a limited right to engage in these five activities if you are not the copyright owner and you want to use a copyrighted work you cannot use that work or anything substantially similar to that work unless you get permission to use the work via a purchase or license unless you are engaged in a fair use or another defense exists um, let's take a break there to see if there's any questions and talk about the ownership. Ownership tends to be a pretty straightforward concept. I think most people are actually going to be more interested in um, what we're coming into now. How do you actually use other people's work? Right. But I'll give it a couple seconds, take a little sip of uh, my drink here. Okay. I, I actually had a question. What about um, a nonprofit group or a, just a uh, somebody who's planning a little fundraiser or something and they decide to write new words to an existing melody to make fun of somebody or you know like the capital steps sort of do this all the time and um, is that it, since in most cases the song the melody would be copyrighted can they get into trouble for that or do you have to get permission in advance to do something like that um, I, I, and here I thought you were going to talk about a nonprofit group and a, and a performance. I thought you were going to talk about the uh, National Press Foundation dinner on March 7th. <laughs> Tickets still available. Um, That's right. But I can't no copyright <laughs> infringement. If you can, if you can, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I heard Bob Lance clapping back there. Uh, if you can hold on, that's going to be discussed in fair use of okay. a few slides. It's a very valid Perfect. question, though. Perfect. Good. Uh, so let's move on into some of the uses. Um, the, the first way in which you would be able to use somebody else's work is to get a license to use the work or purchase an outright use of the work. As I said, you know, they control the, the ways in which their, their work is going to be used. They can, they can set any terms they want. But before we even get to that, the, the internet has brought in a, a sort of new, new manner of using works where you don't actually even have to use the work. You're sort of you're linking to it. You're embedding it on a page. But you're not making a copy in any way. The way it functionally works is when you embed YouTube, the video is still on the YouTube site. It just becomes a direct link of access to the YouTube site. Well, how does that affect copyright law? The answer is I'm actually, you know, 
I don't think linking it in and of itself is a problem. Way back in 1995, this was an issue. Okay, when I first started practicing, this was an issue. Not so much anymore. I think everybody agrees that the open nature of the web and the, the fact that people really do want, you know, you're not making a copy. Um, people do want the traffic and you're driving it to their site means that linking clearly is no longer considered a problem. Um, but embedding is, you know, as I said, brings up different issues. I actually think that embedding a video is much more preferable than doing something tricky like taking a co copy, putting it on your site, and, um, you know, and, and claiming it as your own. I think when you go, especially if you use the official channels on YouTube, the official, you know, the official user's channel on YouTube, you're not going to get any trouble here. So that's one of the reasons that I think the functionality of, of embedding YouTube video, um, if you're doing it on a Facebook page, especially the, the functionality of doing that on a Facebook page, make that my preferred uh, manner of using video. Um, so the second part of, of linking and embedding here is some other, well, it also does bring up some other issues we'll talk about later. The licensing process, fair use, which I don't know if that's, um, that's going to be necessarily a great defense or one you're going to need to bring in. But section, sec, section 512 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is if you do a lot of linking and embedding is something you're going to want to have on, uh, take, take note of, use to your advantage, and have proper language on your website to protect you. Um, as, as, as I said, use that in combination with embedding functions through YouTube's and others, other social networks as your best preferred method of, of pictures or um, video. But what about straight getting permission or licensing? Um, there's obviously no obligation for any owner of copyrighted content to license their work to you. They have, in, in, most, in most instances, 95% of the situations, the only one that I'm going to say is an exception are compulsory licenses that allow the performance of music over the air or online. But in most situations, you're going to have involving, you know, audiovisual works, reprints of articles, pictures, you're going to have to get a license from the person to use them. All right, um, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. It's really just a contract, and negotiate at arm's length, and it can have any number of different, you know, variables to it. One thing I'll say is I'll just point out here the various terms that you are likely to need to have in any sort of agreement. The things you're going to have to think about either as an owner of content that you're letting other people's people use, or content that you want to use. Number one, is the license exclusive or not? Not exclusive. Obviously, if you're a copyright user, you would prefer an exclusive license. You may have to pay more for it, though. But you would want to be the only person that gets to use that content. As an owner, you want to maximize your value, and you don't want to be shut off from relicensing the same piece of content over and over and over and getting paid multiple times. Is your uh, license limited in duration or perpetual? All right, I've seen plenty of situations where we've, we've had a license that is only for five years, and, and especially now with the internet, People just leave leave that picture up on their site. All right, never comes down. There's no cleaning of the site, and ten years later, somebody digs it out, and suddenly, you're technically violating the license that you that you originally made. Um, the types of media covered. I have a double star here because this is something that has become extremely important uh, in the last few years with with um, internet um, access and internet publishing, sort of beginning to outstrip print publishing in many ways. Um, especially with archival uses. All right, If I were to write a contract 20 years ago, I was a content owner and I wrote a contract 20 years ago, my contract said you can reprint my picture in your newspaper. And you came back to me, you know, five years later and said, well, we'd like to, we're, we're going to put this up on our new internet website, I would have every right in the world to say, no, you can't. You have to pay me more now because this is effectively another display of my photo in another medium. And our contract, all it said was print. And this has gone to a number of courts, all of which have said, um, mainly, again, involving freelancers that sold a photo to publications like the New York Times or National Geographic who then want to go back and do a compendium issue on a CD-ROM or use, you know, have an archive section on their website, great historical photos of the, of the, you know, in the New York Times in the 20th century. The courts have all said, no, you didn't, you didn't give the right. You know, this person didn't give the right to you 
to put their photo on the internet. They only gave the right to you to, to put it on in the print publication, which is why now, as someone who writes these contracts, I mean, again, if you're, if you're a copyright owner, you're basically going to try to fight as hard as you can to say, one medium at a time. Come back to me and pay me a little more every time if you want to do it. Or pay me more now for the possibility to use it across multiple media. As a contract user, when I'm representing folks that want to acquire content, I love the phrase, you know, any medium now known or here and after devised, so that anywhere into the future, my people can use that content however they want to, that photo. Actually, this might be a good time to take a question which I think is relevant here, and it mm -hmm. has to do with photos taken off social media. Mm -hmm. So if there's a picture of someone on Facebook and I want to use that picture in something else I'm doing, can I take it from Facebook uh, and does it make a difference whether it's a public photo or not? And are the rules different for Twitter, for Facebook? This all gets very complicated, I think, very relevant now. Uh, if we haven't figured it out by now, we don't own anything from Facebook. They own us. <laughs> All right? They own us. And actually, if you look at their terms of service closely, they do, and, and this has been publicized by a lot of people, they, they do claim ownership in anything on the site. And there was another article today, I think it was in Forbes by, uh, I, I hope I don't get this wrong since it's being recorded, by Kashmir Hill, ah. who used to be a staffer here at the National Press Foundation, right. um, about Facebook having used uh, used information that, that you just liked something or you you know you wrote an endorsement of a play you saw and liked mm -hmm. and suddenly their sponsored advertisements will have your your written words in there mm -hmm. more of an invasion of privacy concern on most parts but it is the position of Facebook that they own anything you put up there and so I think you'd have two problems one you'd have a problem if, if I went to use a photo you posted to your Facebook page I'd have a problem with you because you're the copyright owner. I'd also have a problem if I took it off of Facebook with Facebook who, who would also claim some sort of right of ownership. Mm. The, the, the bigger issue is whether Facebook can really claim that, whether you know my signing up for their terms of service really is something that I've now licensed away to them. Mm. But what's clear is I still would have to get permission in that situation. Um, a couple other licensing issues. Attribution is a term that many, uh, obviously, copyright owners insist upon. If you're going, I, you know, among other things, if you're going to use my photo, give me some credit. Um, that's a common term as well. And finally, you know, there are some licenses that actually do away with all four. I referred to one earlier, the uh, license that allows radio stations, without having to go to every individual songwriter and recording artist, to use, uh, you know, to, to play music and just pay a one-time fee to three different performing performance rights organizations. Bigger licensing question, though. Scarier licensing question. More commonly violated licensing question. Clip art. This picture here is specifically, specifically out of focus. Why? Because I don't really want to get in trouble. And also because um, this was an actual picture used by one of my clients on their website. Um, and they... Uh, they were actually handed a letter or sent a letter by Getty Images, which is, I think, located in Seattle, and represents the interests of a lot of especially freelance photographers. And Getty said that the use of this picture by a church on its website violated the terms of the clip art uh, disc from which they got that. I mean, we all use clip art. As I said, this is one thing that we really need to think about. When you're working with people that have to work across multiple media, need color for stories, you know, they, they may not have time to go out and get that perfect picture. So they do what a lot of us do. They go online, they find it, and they upload it. Problem is, clip art is nothing more than a license. You go to Staples, you buy a disc, you put it, you, you know, you put it in your computer, you go to Microsoft Word, you open the uh, Word function, you open the, the art function, and the, what's the one thing we all don't do? read the terms that pop up on the screen. Right. We just hit OK and we go through. Those terms are a license. They tell you exactly what you can and cannot do with the photos. And in most instances, they prevent commercial uses. And mm. so you're, you're, likely to get, you're likely to get a letter from Getty Images saying, pay us $1,200 for the use of that photo. And you may say to yourself, boy, I don't really think that was a commercial use. Or, you know, there's something fishy about this. But think about that number, 1200 enough to get your attention enough to compensate the uh, photographer, also small enough to make you say, I also really don't want to fight this. I don't want to hire a lawyer to fight this. And Because trust me, in most instances, the, the, 
you know, six hundred dollars savings you might be able to negotiate down to if, if that or whatever else it would could possibly be, you're gonna eat up in legal fees. We don't come cheap. All right. So so you know it's 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 a problem. It's a real problem and it usually ends up working, you know, working out that you're gonna end up paying something to get images, a not insubstantial amount. Better options therefore. Better clip art options include Flickr, Wikimedia Commons, and you have the, I'm going to give the links to both of those in this. Obviously, you can go back and get a copy of this presentation later. Best clip art option, as far as I'm concerned. Best clip art option, Creative Commons. Um, Creative Commons, why? Because if you see as it comes up here, it's just easy to understand. I mean, how easy is it to understand in where you read it in plain English? This is how you have to attribute. This is what you can do in terms of a non-commercial use. You know, it, it, it makes sense. And it, is more, and it is a community of people that actually want these works used by others. So I think that's the, that's the one that I, I like best. Um, so that's at the end of licensing. Next, we're going to get into fair use, but another time perhaps to break the question. Sure. Yeah. In fact, we do have a specific question Good. about licensing, which is, is there a form or a template of standard language that you can use um, to to um, to give someone a license, or if you are seeking a license to use someone else's work and they don't have anything specifically set up? Hmm. Um, Assu yes, assuming I, we don't want to come and pay you to draft it for us. I, I you know, I mean, there are, there are. I, I'll tell you that I had, like everybody else, I mean, I had a situation I had never dealt with at some point. I got on the web, I started looking around, and, and found forms that have been used by others, and they're out there, there's no doubt about it. I still think that you're going to want to use a lawyer at some point to negotiate these terms and to make sure that the rights you are giving away or keeping mm -hmm. are, are exactly what you, know, what you think you're giving away or keeping. Mm -hmm. But they, yeah, they do exist. It's just a matter of a Google search away. I don't, I don't know that any one is better than any other, and I can't think of any good site off the top of my head. Um, if you're an artist or a photographer, one recommendation I will give to you, or a couple recommendations I'll give to you, are to go to Washington Area Lawyers for the Arts here in Washington, D.C., which does try to match people up with pro bono attorneys who can represent them on, on licensing or, or creative issues. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Harvard's Berkman Center um, also has uh, an online media legal network and I'm a member of that and they also you can you can apply there for even pro bono representation where they might be able to find someone who says you know this isn't part of my normal practice but I'd like to get to you know get some practice in working on on licensing issues so I'll take on a, a case here or there for free or a reduced rate so those are a couple options that if you, if you don't feel comfortable just doing it yourself you could find thank you yep let's move on to fair use fair use another very difficult and misunderstood concept. Something that scares me, uh, uh, probably second in this whole area to, it's on the internet, therefore I'm allowed to use it. Uh, in terms of things that scare me every day, are people, especially you know, folk, people coming to me saying, well, I thought what I was doing was a fair use, when it was not even remotely a fair use in any sense of the word, common or, you know, commonly fair or legally fair. And, and the reason is that, that I do get these questions all the time, like, well, I thought that like anything under 30 seconds of a song is by definition fair. Or I thought I could use anything under 15 seconds of a movie clip and not have to worry about it. No, that's, that's right now, just a flat out, all serious, not true. Um, fair use is a statutory construct. It is a four-part test of which the amount that you know that someone uses is only one of the four parts and even that isn't really a part into itself because as you see from the chart here on the screen the amount and the substantiality have to be considered what a court really has to do though is go through all four of these factors and determine on balance it's not it's not a uh, there's no formula to it it's not a if you get 3 you win and your use is fair um, it's just going to look at all of them and with, with sort of a, a feeling for how things break down, determine whether the use is fair or not. And that's why I've created sort of a chart here to give you an idea of whether your proposed use might be more fair or not, taking into all these factors. 
So you have to look at the nature of the original work. Was that work non-commercial in nature, meaning the person never expected to get paid? Or was it commercial in nature, meaning they explicitly wanted to get paid, and any time that someone uses this and doesn't pay them, you know, they're, they're losing out. Um, is your use something that's traditionally non-commercial? Or is it something that you're using, you're getting paid off of? So I mean, look at these first two. I can give you an example. Um, again, going back to the National Press Foundation Awards Center on March, March 7th. 7th. <laughs> Tickets still available. Um, one, of the, I was talking to one of the awardees at that dinner, Lucy, da uh, Lucy Douglas, and and she was telling me how they, they've got all this. You know, this is a plug for the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. They have an amazing repository of work up on on their site. And she said that one, um, you know, one legal publisher came to her and said, "Oh, you know, we really love this." this product you've put together with relation to open government laws, um, we'd like to incorporate into one of our packages. And you know, it's all free on the Reporters Committee website. She says to the guy, well, well what's your, pa you know, which package is this? He said, well, it's our, it's our, you know, legal tools for a reporter's package, blah, blah, blah. We charge 300 some dollars. And Lucy's sort of like, well, we did it for free, but now you're gonna free ride off of us. And you know, I mean, so, so even if the original work is non-commercial, you don't want other people to, to you know, profit off of the fruits of your labor. So you have, that's where, where I say you really have to look at the entirety of these factors. Going back to your question here, um, what about the use of a song? Well, one of the things we can see is more likely to be fair is a parody, mm -hmm. okay? Because let's say you take one of these, like, like you're the Capitol Steps, and you take one of these popular songs and set it to music. Does that mean people, um, you know, have no use for the original song? No. Actually, if you go down to the bottom, it probably will send those people to go find the original song. They may have never heard the song that you're, par that you're using in your parody. They may say, you know, I really like that. I'm going to go buy the original now. <laughs> That's a fair use to its core. That is something that, that will drive people to, and, wh and what the court is really going to look at, um, will drive people to the original work, make them want to buy it rather than taking it out of the marketplace. So again, it's, it's the nature of the use. More likely to be fair if you were using a non-commercial work that was never intended for profit. Number two, your use is non-commercial. It's news, it's editorial. You're using a video clip as part of a review of a movie. You know, you're publishing online now and your movie, movie reviewer, you know, they've written their, their, their uh, review for the, the weekend section of the Washington Post, but online you now are able to show a little clip of the movie that you, that you uh, have. Or a song, a song clip as part of an album review. Fair, that's more likely to be fair because it's news editorial commentary. Parody or transform, something that transforms the way you're using the original work is considered fair. Especially if you're only using a small portion. You're not putting that entire song into the review. You're not putting the spoiler into the movie review. You know, I hope I don't ruin this here by the way, but you know, if you did your movie review of The Sixth Sense, I specifically chose it 16 years later, and you reveal in the review, even though you only use 30 seconds, that Bruce Willis has been dead the entire time. Okay? <laughs> That's, yeah, that is not going to be fair. People are not going to go see that movie. That's the substantiality, okay? That's, that is sort of the concept of fair use played out in a couple examples. Here's a couple more examples. Text, text uh, and this is largely resolved as well, at least in the U.S., not so much overseas. But I think we've seen the idea that even though the lead paragraph contains sort of the meat of any article, um, you know, the, the Google News format tends to tends to be court approved. That you use a paragraph, especially if you're sending the people then to the site, that's okay. So in a text sense, that seems to be a, a, an acceptable use, a fair use. Now, this if this if we were doing the the actual video today, was an actual fair use case. You see a uh, child here, I think he's 18 months old, pushing a little one of these plastic strollers, and and I'll, I'll flesh it out for you. Imagine this is a child in his own kitchen, pushing this cra and running crazy around in circles around the kitchen. His mom's pulled out a, a camera phone and, and videotaping it. And in the background, the reason he's going crazy is, let's go crazy, is playing by Prince. And if you didn't know it already, Prince is a little nuts, okay? And one thing Prince is nuts about is his own copyright. He, he spends, apparently spends hours online at a time looking for unauthorized uses of his, his copyrighted work. And he had, his, uh, he had Universal Music Group fire off a letter this to actually to YouTube, because she po the woman posted this to YouTube, and we'll talk about this again when we get to Digital Millennium Copyright Act, Section 512, told YouTube to take it down because it was a violation of his copyrighted work. 
And the woman said, no, it's just a fair use. And the court ended up siding with this woman, saying that a 28-second video of a child running around to Let's Go Crazy was not an unauthorized use of, of Prince's, um, Prince's song. In fact, I mean, it's exactly what fair use is. It's sort of a parody in a way. You've got this kid running around, going crazy to Let's Go Crazy, and Prince isn't being harmed in any way. Mm -hmm. Photos are more difficult because, as we know, it's very difficult to use a photo without, you know, in, in any sort of insubstantial way. You usually have to use the photo or not use the photo. So with photos, what we're really looking for are whether, again, it enhances, it, or it, it enhances what you are already trying to do in a news report. That is even going to be tricky because, of course, you know, most, most photographers don't want you to use their work without permission. More likely, something that is transformative. I told you that you cannot use something that is identical or substantially similar to a copyrighted work. So we have a, a poster here for the Borat movie, and someone makes a parody poster for Barack Obama 2008. Um, not identical, but it was something that at least raised a question of whether there was a copyright infringement. Because it is a substantially, this is a quintessential example of a substantially similar use that is not identical. However, it's also a fair use. Finally, another fair use situation was somebody put a book together um, that someone put a book together that uh, had famous Grateful Dead concert pictures of you know the 1960s and early 70s, and they were taken wholesale, put into the book. It was mo I think the whole book was actually about the San Francisco music scene during that period, and the owners of these posters sued, saying that their right their you know work should not have been used without compensation. And the book owner actually wins in the case because, again, this was a, a transformative use. It was a commentary. It was a historical repository. They weren't actually going, nobody, this wasn't going to satisfy anybody in the market for going out and buying one of these posters that they wanted to ha uh, hang on the wall. In fact, the court said, this is more likely to make somebody look at that poster that's in more of a thumbnail type, you know, selection on a, a printed page and say, I'd love to buy that. i, I got to find that, and I'm going to go out and buy it. So, th so one of our viewers actually has asked for a better description of transformative use. Is, is that key to it, that it might drive the viewer to go and purchase the original, or? Transformative, transformative is probably more, more apt to be considered like a parody or a reworking. Um, some sort of commentary mm -hmm. that incorporates the original, the original work. It doesn't have to be a flat out parody. It could be something that, that makes a statement because let's say you, um, well, let me think one example. The song, uh, the song Imagine by John Lennon mm -hmm. was used in um, a movie called Expelled, by, which was a documentary about creationism um, as being, you know, and, and the concept of creationism and intelligent design mm -hmm. and evolution being taught in schools. Mm -hmm. And the argument made there was that that was a transformative use because it made a statement about, you know, the use of the song Imagine made an explicit statement about what the author of the movie or the creator of the movie was trying to say, okay? Because mm -hmm. you, know, you have the lyrics Imagine, there's no religion, things like that. Yeah. Um, that's a transformative use. Okay. I hope that helps. Feel free to follow up with me if I didn't answer your question there. Uh, any more questions before we move on to remedies and some defenses? Y yes, there's one other question, um, apparently from an editor who sent a reporter out to take a videotape of a story slam festival. And one of the performers in this slam said that the paper would, or the publication would need permission to use his video even though it was only a part of his performance. It wasn't the whole thing, it may have just been 10 or 15 seconds. Hmm. Um, the thing about fair use, again, and one of the reasons that, that I urge people to, this is another area where I urge people to really consult with attorneys, is it, it is not a one-size-fits-all. Again, only 10 to 15 seconds. I would want to know how that was used. I would want to know exactly how much was used. I would want to see, you know, in, in relation to the overall performance, which part was used. Um, but I could very much see it being a fair use if you took, say, five seconds and you were doing a larger story about a poetry slam in the local community for especially for kids or something like that you know it's a real story and you want to give it some color and it was only five seconds and nobody was going to be harmed nobody was going to lose their product um, and if it was a news story I could see a couple issues where people do tend to say well what I'm doing is fair but then it starts to veer into non-fair mm -hmm. 
you promote something of your own using that. Like, hey, these are some of the stories that the Washington Post brought you last week, and suddenly you use that clip to promote people you know, wanting to buy subscriptions or check you out online. Now you've commercialized that use, and you're making money off it, and that could be a problem. Okay, that's, that's, that's one. Um, another issue would be, actually, as you go into these venues, and this is not a copyright issue, but you may not be able to take video. I mean, they have, they have some very specific rules uh, at live performances, music, sports, of course, things like that. It could be a topic for another, uh, another webinar at some point in the future, but you may not be able to go in and take shoot video and use it in any way without proper credentialing. I don't think the artist is going to be the one that can make that argument to you, but the venue might. Right. Um, people are still struggling with this uh, transformative use. The, the question here is, how is a journalistic use of text yeah. transformative? Uh, a journalistic use of text is probably not going to raise issues of transformative, especially if it's just a news story or an editorial where you're quoting a small portion. Mm -hmm. I think that news is all, I mean, before you even get to transformative, you had news editorial commentary mm -hmm. above that on that slide. Um, and I think you're not going to have to worry about transformative there. We're talking about more things that are a little more commercialized, like the Capitol Steps, like Saturday Night Live, like The Simpsons doing parodies of, you know, if you ever watch The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror, every one of those is like a parody of a Twilight Zone episode at some point in the past. But it's, it's transformative. I mean, it, it takes the story and it, it does it in a different way. And again, the, uh, the end result is if you had never seen any of those and you later found out, hey, it's a Twilight Zone episode, you might want to go and search out the Twilight Zone if you had never heard Absolutely. about this and find it. That's transformative. So for most journalists, actually, you're going to fall neatly, as long as your, your story is for news editorial commentary and your use is you know, not really substantial and not a huge amount tied directly to the news portion of the story and not gratuitous in any way to, you know, it's got a relation to the news story, I think you're going to be all right. All right. What happens if you mess all this up? What's at stake? Well, oops, I'm hitting the wrong button. Remedies. Okay. Uh, anybody who has a, a, any copyright at all has, whether, you know, whether registered or not at the time they create it, has the right to get actual damages from you if you violate their copyright. Uh, those are the profits that they have lost or the profit that you might have gained through your infringing use. Now, if somebody has registered their copyright before or within three months of the creation of that work, they would also have the ability to get statutory damages upon their choice. I mean, the law here gives a lot, of, a lot of power to the copyright owner. And as you can see, those damages can range pretty high, as high as $150,000 per work, if it's shown that you engaged in a willful copyright infringement. There are also other options at their disposal, such as an actual injunction to make you stop using the work altogether, and even, especially in you know, repeat offender situations, criminal prosecutions. That could include fines or jail time. Um, so what are some of the other things you can do to help yourself then avoid these really bad, uh, excuse me, really bad damages? Well, one, make sure that you have on your website, if you're, if you're a web-oriented publisher or using the web at all, we talked a little bit last week about terms of use in section, or last month about Section 230, the Communications Decency Act, how it protects you against liability for, um, for defamation, invasion of privacy, things like that. We said how it does not necessarily protect you for violations. Well, it does not protect you for violations of copyright or trademark. Well, it, it's still worth making sure that on your website, you are very clear that any of your content should not be used. Okay? So your terms of use, in addition to protecting you against liability at the hands of others for, for various things, non-copyright claims, clearly does restate your copyright in all of your content clearly state that people need to talk to you before they use those, that content. And clearly state that anything other people put up on the site can be taken down for any number of reasons, including that it's a copyright infringement situation. But I've referred a couple times now to Section 512 of the, Co of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which I teased a little bit last month as the equivalent, the copyright equivalent of Section 230. And Section 512 is another statute that completely immunizes the web host, the website owner, from copyright infringement based on actions committed by third parties. So if you, if best example, because they live and die by this, is YouTube. You are YouTube. Somebody uploads a video that is a, you know, a straight 
copyright violation. They take wholesale an episode of The Simpsons and post it on YouTube so others can see it. Okay? Will YouTube get in trouble for this every time that happens? Obviously the answer is no or they'd be out of business by now. Better question is why? And the answer to that question is Section 512 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Something YouTube uses, something most websites use, and something you should be using. What this law basically says is you get this immunity as the website owner and operator if you provide notification regarding policies pertaining to repeat copyright infringement offenses. All right, you say that in addition to everything else, we will take action against people who come to our site and repeatedly infringe copyrights, including kick him off the site altogether. You designate an agent for service of proper Digital Millennium Copyright Notice and Takedown requests and counter no notifications on your website and with the United States Copyright Office. I'll show you. Um, examples of this language in just a second, but you need to have a particular person with contact information listed, all right, that can be contacted if somebody feels as though their rights have been violated. And finally, you are act largely as a passive conduit and follow required procedures when provided with proper notification of a copyright infringement. A couple of examples on each of these. This is the language, this next slide is the language that will alert people to the fact that repeat of infringers could be kicked off the site. It should, you know, I mean, these, this language should A, appear in your general terms of service, and I also think it should be part of whatever you put in front of someone when they sign up, you know, if they have to register to use your site, it should be this, this DMCA specific language should be in your terms of service and put in front of them um, at that time. Again, here's the language that will deal with repeat offenders, and it's taken from our own firm site just to show you that we actually do this ourselves. Um, and here's the language that will provide the identity of a notice and takedown person. This is the person that if I, a copyright owner, feels my, my uh, copyrighted work has been posted to the Fletcher Hilton Hildreth website without my permission, it tells me exactly where I have to go and what I have to do to get it taken down. And finally, the last part of this is following the proper procedures. Number one, when the designated agent, well, first of all, you have no hand in posting the allegedly infringing material. Much as we saw with Section 230, if you or one of your employees actually engages in the infringement or violation, you cannot claim the immunity. Number two, you don't financially gain in any way from the infringing material. It's not a sponsored, you know, it's not like a sponsored post or anything like that. You have no prior knowledge that the material infringes on another's copyright, and most importantly, you follow all proper procedures. And what this really means is, when you or your notice and your your designated agent for notice and takedown purposes gets a notification that says my copyrighted material has been posted without my permission, please take it down. You take it down. You don't play lawyer. You don't play judge, you don't play God, you don't play anything. You take it down. And then you turn around and you go back to wherever the poster was and say, we were served with the notice and takedown request for this piece of material. We took it down, we're letting you know. They have the right to request that it be reposted, at which point you're then supposed to go back to the original copyright owner and say, we're gonna repost this unless we hear from you that you have taken action on your own within a certain time period. But the important part is I'm, I'm sort of glossing over it in the interest of time here. And because the important part is if you're going to use the Section 512 procedures, you need to A, have a policy against repeat infringement clearly posted on your site. B, you need to have a clearly designated person to be the agent to receive notice and take down requests. And C, when you get those requests, you take the material down. That's it. Uh, so I think we're back to questions now because I have left you, the last thing I'm leaving you with is a nice handy chart to walk you through all these steps. If you ever get caught anywhere, maybe print out this one page, give it to your people, send them out, laminate it, send them out into the field with it. It's all in one place. The little checklist that I've gone through in the last hour, all right there. Well, Just that, take that them off your sounds side. very useful. <laughs> um, we actually had a couple of questions Good. from before, about very specific about aggregation practices. Okay. For example, if you want to post some, some uh, if you want to aggregate someone else's story to your news website, can you reprint their first paragraph with a link back to their source, or do you have to rewrite that 
uh, a I, I mean, I, I would I would take the first paragraph. I mean, that's what Google does, and Google mm -hmm. is the the king of all aggregators, and <laughs> and they've gotten away with it for some time now. As I said, in the U.S., they have. There's been problems overseas where where uh, in Europe they've run into some issues, but but here they've won this in any number of formats from news to actually thumbnails of pornographic you know pictures. I mean, everything they've they've won hands down as an aggregator on by keeping just a very small amount and then linking. Providing a link right, that goes directly to through. Yes. Yeah. Uh, even better. I mean, if you really want to feel good about yourself legally and you know ethically, you'd actually allow that to open into a new window, so the other person, you know, the, the other the other site actually gets gets full credit, and frankly, it helps you by having by leaving your site on the first screen as well. Right. Right. I like it. Um, other another question is about the best way to attribute if you're taking something from Wikipedia or from Flickr. What's the best way to attribute it? Is there, uh, how should you physically? Uh, they're usually going to tell you how it how it should be. Um, especially, I think again, another reason for Creative Commons is they tell you exactly how they want it attributed. So I think it's going to be on that site if I recall. Okay, so if you're going to use something from one of those sites, read the site information, and I think that's yes. good information. Always, no matter where Always. you are on the web. Yes. Read those license agreements uh, as as tiresome. As I mean, you know, especially with Flickr though, where people are using. Um, Sometimes pseudonyms as, as a photographer, I know they do. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen plenty of folks that that it, I think it, it is the Flickr policy that you're going by the Flickr screen name. Right. Okay. Well, we are out of time today. I want to thank everyone for participating in this webinar. I want to remind you that next month we will be back on March 20th. We're going to talk about legal issues for news gathering. So a whole new host of legal issues, and I know that's going to be very valuable. Uh, a reminder that a recording of this session, as well as last month's webinar and information about other NPF programs and our dinner, are all on our website at www.nationalpress.org. I'm Linda Streitfeld, Kevin Goldberg, thank you so much, Thanks. and we'll see you next month. <laughs>